I'm from the University of Bath, UK, and I have a BBSRC Tools and Resources Development Fund grant to extract phylogenetic data from the literature, specifically uh, phylogenetic trees, branch lengths, and possibly support values, uh, basically the relationships between organism, uh, organisms to recreate the tree of life. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because not many people actually share that data in a reusable form, and it's a shame. We publish you know, hundreds and thousands of trees over the last uh, decade, and it's a bit of a waste, really. And it's really interesting data that has high reuse value, so it's really worthwhile re-extracting from the literature. And I know so many PhD students and graduate students and undergrad students that are just used as slaves to re-extract this from PDFs and type it in themselves, and it's just such a waste. So we really need better tools to actually get this data back from PDFs until publishers actually start doing it right and enforcing um, data deposition. So here's my talk structure. The slides are up on SlideShare. I'm going to skip this slide because we're running out of time. So uh, why do we hack it from the literature? I was involved in the first paper there, BMC Research Notes paper, and we estimate that only about 4% of phylogenetic trees are archived. Um, other papers have estimated slightly higher, but they've used slightly different methods. Um, I'm not going to go over that. Um, this might be fun if you're interested in phylogenetic analyses. I'm not even sure even experts in the field know where the most phylogenetic analyses per year are published. And so I've done a little research for this in my thesis. And it turns out, of course, it's the International Journal of Systematic and Evolutionary Microbiology, because any time anyone names a new species of bacterium, they do a little phylogenetic analysis of it. Um, so that, in terms of volume, is where most of the phylogenetic analyses are in terms of journals, but PLOS One is right up there, obviously, because it's such a high-volume journal. So it's really interesting in terms of publishing trends. But there's also this huge, huge long tail. And so it'd be really convenient for myself in this project if everything was published in one or two journals across maybe three or four publishers, but it's not like that. Um, unfortunately, you know, there are publishers out there that are extremely popular with scientists that publish in PDF only. No HTML, no XML, no, no text mining, any kind of useful stuff like that. It's only in a PDF. And a lot of phylogenetic trees and useful data gets published there. Um, so we've really got to develop some tools to hack this out of the literature if we're actually going to be able to test against previous hypotheses. And there are various other problems, like um, the fact that indexes don't, sometimes don't actually index the full text. So you may not even know there's a phylogenetic analysis in the paper. Um, obviously, no individual academic has actually access to all journals, and there's a huge long tail of journals. Um, copyright imposed restrictions that you're not allowed to do format shifting if it's a PDF. Um, and, uh, but luckily, in the UK, that we've got a new copyright exception, thanks to the Hargreaves report, uh, which will um, help enable and protect us in doing our research, which we previously didn't have. Um, I know here in the US you have fair use. We don't really have that in the UK. We have something called fair dealing, which is weak source in comparison. Um, Pensoft publishers deserve a lot of praise because they actually make it very easy for people like me who are interested in reusing phylogenetic trees. They've actually got a little tick box on their, on their search that you can actually search for a particular data type, either taxonomic keys or phylogenetic trees. <coughs> Unfortunately, not many people publish there. Um, so what I've been doing in this research, as I've, been, I've only been doing this for about three or four months. I've just come out of my PhD. This is my first postdoc. Um, just for fun, on the side, while I've been collecting these trees where they are in the literature, if they're open access under the Creative Commons Attribution License, I've been re-uploading the image to Flickr. So I've got a huge database of about 10,000 trees now, um, just as a corpus to test against. And it, it's quite fun, because it's a really good feature-rich API, so there's lots of things you can do with it. And here's an example of a particular figure. You've got um, the source of where it came from, the figure text, and that's all searchable. Um, and it's open, and there's metrics, and it's interesting. One minute left. Wow. OK. Um, PLOS do some interesting things. They embed data in their figure, so that's really useful. Well done, PLOS. I wish more publishers did that. Um, 10,000 figures. Go and explore those Flickr accounts. They're really, really interesting. Got lots and lots of figures there, and I think um, figure search is something that we should do. I, I do know about Yale Image Finder as well. Um, previous work, there has been previous work, I'm going to briefly acknowledge that here. Um, Tree Ripper was automated, but very picky as the style of tree it chose. Tree Snatcher Plus is very good, but it's entirely manual. So our approach is going to be entirely automated, and I have uh, Peter murray Ross, who's a computational chemist, to thank for this part, uh, helping with the computer vision and such, and OCR. And we've got binarization, thinning, largest pixel island is likely to be the tree structure, and then we've got reusable phylogenetic data. 
Um, so there's where it is at the moment, currently in very, very active development, like the last 24 hours there's been movement on it. <laughs> And yes, there's all the technical details, Java, Maven, Apache PDF box, Booth CV, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, my last slide now. Um, even in online-only journals, people are still publishing these ridiculously composite figures, um, which are not machine-readable. There's no data behind the figure provided. Um, can we please stop doing this and actually have individual figures? You know, we can display them with HTML next to each other if you want, but there's no need for them to be all squished into one figure because that really harms both human readability and machine readability. And that's it. Thank you.